appreciated the the suggestion that sometimes the discernment of the arts, there's an intuitive character to it, right? In contrast to a more analytic approach, which um, perhaps some would say is a sort of a more Western approach, but we, we won't necessarily need to parse that one. Um, so, you know, growing up Pentecostal, for instance, um, it was sort of imbibed. Now, is that the intuitive sex, sex, uh, aspect of it? That there were certain sort of musical forms that were that we were supposed to be less um, open to, right? Uh, so, how much of this intuition, perhaps, is also sometimes not just culturally shaped, but tradition shaped by certain certain kinds of Christian traditions that itself is complicated and so on. So, on the one hand, I want to say yes and amen that that we need to affirm the intuitive responses to these issues. On the other hand, I also feel like sometimes the set of intuitions that I grew up with were also, in some respects, rather limited. I, th I think you're right that it's, it's a combination of thinking through uh, the artistic forms of the church, but also the intuitions. I mean, it was interesting in the village where people would compose songs but there was actually a kind of vetting com co uh, committee. They wouldn't. They didn't call it that. <laughs> trust me. Uh, but it was uh, people who who um, had a good sense of the Dita language, who had a good sense of the music and and also um, of the text, where people could come and sing a song to this group and receive some correction. It wasn't automatic that a song that was composed made it into the choir. Uh, they were there. There was a kind of vetting process. Um, so um, there are different ways that one can do that. What I see is uh, the danger on the other side, though, too, for for faith communities or worship teams who don't think through the sort of implications of what they're offering a congregation as a worship diet, um, they tend to default to majority culture <laughs> because that's just music, it dominant culture. Um, so in one church I visited one time that was composed of a Hispanic community, African-American community, white community, and the worship team was also composed of that. Uh, I, I sat through the worship service and all of the music ended up being sort of what I would call, you know, generic praise songs that people sing around the world. And when I went up afterward to the leader and said, how do you determine what songs you sing? <laughs> um, and the answer was a little shocking and I didn't even know where to start, but um, the answer was, well, we've decided as a group not to do cultural music. <laughs> That's what I mean by when people don't don't think through the implications of what they're doing, they default to the dominant uh, culture, which, you know, if you ask people of the dominant culture, they don't have a culture, they're just normal. Um, and that's the problem. <laughs> and globally, that's the problem. Um, so we do have to think creatively about what is intuition and what is some serious work on how to embrace the cultural diversity that, that we are in the church. The reason I brought that up is uh, I find sometimes in our chapel, there'll be a new song that's, that's sung and everybody's just all into it. And they are singing it and sometimes they're crying. I think, what is going on? What's going on with that music? I felt that today we were singing this uh, Hebrew song. It was uh, sort of a lament. It was beautiful. It was done so well. And, and I, I felt like saying, okay, let's analyze this. What's this coming from? Is, is it a Hebrew thing? Is it because t people take Hebrew here or people have European background? No, there are Koreans and African-Americans that are into this. So what is it about that that draws us in and really expresses you know, what's in our heart? And so it, it uh, draws together. It's very different from the music that I was raised on, I think. But it, so... And then another example that I have is I, I used a uh, batik from uh, Bali on the front of a book that I, I did. And I've had so many people say, oh, that's a, that's a really neat looking 
painting. It's a batik of Jesus on the cross, bright colors, and the, the, and the book uh, is about suffering and glory. And so the picture depicts that. And for some reason or another, it doesn't matter if they're Africans or you know Latinos or whatever, they respond to that art. So there's certain kinds of things that it's hard to figure out. Why does somebody from all these different cultures draw into that and expresses something for it? And uh, you know, I, I don't know the answer to it, but I think that both the, analyzing these things and talking about it is important, but also uh, entering into something and just receiving it, I guess. So tapping into that affective dimension yeah. in which when we and we and as academics we tend to want to then analyze right yeah, yeah. but that's that paradox is and that's that mystery i think that both of you are talking about that there's something about this affective dimension which we're all caught up in at a certain level that allows us to cross these boundaries and then we start trying to analyze them and then try to produce a kind of rule or a kind of which which really escapes that right it, these are the kinds of things that sort of that that embodied affective response to this stimulus, this, which is more on the imaginative side, it's more on the, on the, uh, right, uh, so, so, sort of thinking imaginatively is different from thinking analytically. I think that's part of what we're trying to also name here. All right. The worship music of, here's a, here's a question. The worship music of Western churches in America and Western Europe is so rapidly changing and seems to have been hijacked by a few new franchises. How do we contextualize its global consumer? How do we contextualize the global consumer society? I would ask James Crable. That's what I would do. There's a great country music line that says, "If you don't want to hear how the waters parted, don't get me started." Uh, no, just kidding. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to discipline myself to try to keep learning and working on this issue because it's more complicated than it might appear. Um, you know, on one hand, it, it does represent um, an empire of standardization where people feel like their artistic expressions have no value because they don't sound or look like that. So there is that. <laughs> um, on the other hand, um, I heard um, second, third generation um, immigrants say, you know, when I travel around the world um, and go into a new urban context and so on, um, I don't feel the, the cultural aesthetic pull of the culture from, what I, from which I come. Uh, my grandparents do. My parents still do and wish I did, <laughs> but I don't. So when I gather in an urban context with people from 50 different origins and we are able to sing the same music, then I feel like it's my music. Um, I, I mean, that's never been my experience in the way that, that that's described. Let me, let me add something about that, because what you, what you just described, I thought, it's, it's my music, it's our music, and it brings us together, and that brings us to a new level of appreciation, because there's a sense of the unity in Christ, we're sharing this thing together, so it's no longer I have to do my music, but wow, I've entered into this music together, Right. And there's that unity thing that uh, is another sort of uh, intuitive thing we feel that's, is right. The, the problem still is <laughs> the people who have the money and technology to create that common sound uh, produce an, an artistic expression, which is cultural. <laughs> uh, so that's the ongoing challenge. Which is, again, interestingly, because you've already mentioned that whether it's in Burma or in West Africa, this is not the first time this has come around, right? Um, I, I will say that in, in terms of this particular question, uh, one of our PhD graduates from here not too long ago, her name is Tanya Richies, mm -hmm. and she's edited a book with uh, another colleague on the Hillsong movement. And I only mention it, not necessarily to give an advertisement for Hillsong, but it's, it's really this question. And it's about the Hillsong movement in, in Europe, in, uh, in Asia, and in Africa, and in South America. And so I think that that kind of a book gives us some perspective on – 
How do we ask these kinds of questions and do it in, in a responsible way as well? How do we have an affective missionary encounter with a different culture? One of the things that it definitely requires is um, rather than assuming that the aesthetic expressions that mean something to you have to mean something to everyone around the world. So that when you plant a church or you work in trauma healing or whatever, I mean, I was just talking to a group of people who um, who do this trauma, well, it's, it's sort of a women's group empowerment uh, in different places around the world. And they, they, they told me they have this song that they sing at the end that is just so powerful because no matter where you go in the world, it works. I question that. I mean, I wasn't in all the seminars, um, but not, you know, like as we've, I think there's a round table that's going to talk about this. You know, m music is not a universal language. It's a universal phenomenon. And if that's the case, then it, then it, we we need to set aside for a while what is meaningful to us, as meaningful as it might be, um, and say, what what communicates here? We need to listen. We need to get to know the artists, get to know the poets, get to know the writers uh, and any other artists um, and and study what they're doing, get to learn to know them, help understand why they do what they do. Um, and, and then it really empower them. I mean, when you look at how much resource we put into training preachers, uh, when people go back to their homes and are getting Sunday dinner ready, they do not repeat the sermon. They sing the songs. But how- Is this true? <laughs> I had no idea. I'm so glad that you found that out before going to Gordon. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be very helpful. It'll be very helpful. Thank you. So, um, so my question is, how much have we invested in the artists who create the, the images and so on that you were talking about? In one Congolese uh, church I visited... They one of the people on their pastoral staff was and was a chaplain to to the musicians. That's all they did. They went around to different villages. They had Bible studies. They listened to the songs that were being written. This is a Congolese person who was doing this. Much more, someone coming from outside needs to take that posture and imagine that God's already at work before I got there. Okay, so can you comment in thirty to forty five seconds on the contributions of high art? In maybe in contrast to popular art in relationship to mission? In every culture of the world, there are different degrees and levels of appreciation of art. And all sort of what, what some might call high art for other people, that's just our regular art. That's what I deal with every day. For some people, what's low art might be for them very high art because I worked you know, hard at this. And the gospel is to be communicated at every level, every direction, in all ways. It, it should be have that same kind of ubiquity. I like that word today. And therefore, uh, yes, all is necessary. And so we need to engage at all different levels. I remember I had friends who were going off to uh, work with the very wealthy people in Mexico. And I said, why? He says, well, they're a very unreached people group. And so I was like, oh, I'd love to reach out to those people. <laughs> um, but it's true that uh, the art should be able to connect with people at all different levels. And so if they're tuned into a certain station, there needs to be some kind of art, music, communication that they're, they're tuned into. It's if you've ever read, wrong? if you've ever read the book, uh, what's it called, Gospel in Blue Suede Shoes or something, he identifies three levels: the high art, low art, popular, and folk art, which is what everybody in the world does except in the West. <laughs> now, the, the the problem with some of these is that you're not just describing things, but you've put evaluative expressions onto them. So we might start by taking the word high art out of our vocabulary or low art, because these are all hierarchized, hierarchialized. You can create, Mennonites can create words too. Yeah, That's thank fine. you. Yeah. 
we've done that. So, uh, so my my comment just would be, it's not that helpful to use words like high and low, uh, because what people find meaningful is what they find meaningful. All right. You could have good and bad in terms of just <laughs> performance, but that's different than classifying a whole genre as high or low. Okay, here's an easy question, um, 30 to 45 seconds. It was suggested that sexuality is not to be a part of worship. Is Solomon's Song of Songs, though biblical, then not good for church music inspiration? I suggest that sexuality is another category of worship. Question mark? Luckily, that's your... <laughs> <laughs> that was actually my original address I was going to ask you about that, the Song of Solomon. I think it's a very good question. And uh, my, I guess my answer would be, we all have, and this is the intuitive part, we all know that's a little bit inappropriate to be engaged in some kind of sexual dance in church that might tend our mind away from Jesus Christ and towards the woman sitting next to us in the pew. There's an intuitive thing about that. I'm not going to uh, write up a description of what is pornography and what is good art and so forth, but the church does need to be able to talk about that and appreciate the sensual nature, the affective as well as sensual nature of our relationship with God. That's a huge stream within uh, the history of spirituality in, uh, in the church, not only in the West, but also in the East. I do talk in the chapter about one genre of music that was presented to the evangelist Harris, and it was the love songs, uh, songs that were composed and performed uh, when the full moon would come out and young guys would line up on one side of the market space and the women on the other, and they'd sing these songs back and forth, you know, like, here I am under the mango tree, ripe and ready to pick. We do that on Wednesday nights out here oh, at yeah. Fuller, as a matter of fact. <laughs> And, and he said, no, probably not. You know, that's, uh, let's, what else do you have? You know, <laughs> now, uh, I've often wondered what would have happened to the whole, the church if he would have said, yeah, that's perfect. Go for it. Uh, but so, so that doesn't answer th this question, but it was the choice he made, uh, in encouraging a particular genre, um, that he thought was going to be more helpful to the church. All right, good. We got that easy question out of the way. So this is a more difficult one here. Um, it says, cognitive science informs us about the common processes that all human beings pass to learn and stay, uh, to learn and then engage in language and culture. How might this inform our common human ability to appreciate the diversity of expressions in music and the arts? I'm reading a book right now on uh, reading, and it talks about the way the brain uh, begins to be wired as we learn to read. And I would say I could translate this to the arts also. If you live in Bali, everybody's an artist in Bali. I mean, everybody does artwork. That's just the way you're, you're raised, which is very different from the way I was raised. Because of that, your brain is beginning to develop that way. You think that way. You begin to look that way. You imagine things that way. Whereas I was taught to read a book and go across, feel the book, underline the book, touch it, you know, it became a part of me. And so that being the case, I think we need to be attentive to those ways that our brain is developed as we grow up. And it's not just for the children of that generation. These are things that are firmly embedded for generations and generations. And so we see children behave different ways around art, around music, in different cultures, um, regardless. So that's just a hint at what's behind that. I don't know the full answer to that, but that's a very good question. I, I would imagine that, uh, you know, as, as as we're also learning differently through technologies or other emerging forms of yeah. pedagogies that our brains, uh, I think the term is plasticity. There's a, a certain way in which we're, we're able also to adapt. Yeah. In, let me, in the let way me in add on to that. Uh, the book is by Marianne Wolf. It's Reader Come Home. And she describes that we need to learn to become um, bilingual. We need to learn to be readers who read long-term things in order to understand analogy and allegory because if we're only reading electronically, we begin, we, we get snippets and so forth. It's not that we do one or the other, but we have to be uh, bilingual. I like the fact that in Bali, they're all artists, right? I mean, there's uh, the theologian in me says that we're all theologians, but we just need to sort of awaken to that. But maybe another truth is that we're all artists in some respects, since God is also the, the ultimate artist. And many, maybe many for many of us, our artistic antennae have been stunted or whatever. I certain for me, but but James, here's maybe a revision a rev revision of that question. Um, it says, um, since music is affective, a f f 
Since music is affective, cognitive, and physical, can we also assume it is spiritual? Does this affect the idea? Does this affect the idea of a song being anointed? I mean, part of being anointed is is really cultural. <laughs> uh, if, if anointed means it's anointed for me, it, it's it's really meaningful to me. Um, often that's that's also based on cultural appreciation. Um, whether it's just objectively anointed, you know, flying around in the sky and no matter where it lands, it's going to have the same effect. I don't think that's generally the way it works. Um, but um, th- it's clear that there are some songs that speak um, in so many different contexts. One of the things I used to do in... Um, in the course I taught here some years ago on theology of song was uh, I, there's this mood wheel <laughs> of about uh, a dozen different moods in music. Um, and over the years, I collected versions of Amazing Grace mm. that I think c- are captured by every one of those moods. <laughs> so, uh, you know, pl- you know, sort of... Uh, mournful or joyful or, I mean, whatever the mood is, they can be performed in such a way and anointed and meet a need in a particular mood of the context um, by the way it's performed. So, um, I mean, that's just one example that comes to mind that, uh, and that's within a context where people are drawn to that song, words, and melody. If you plunk that down in the middle of India, it might not work in any form. Maybe. So a couple more last, two, last, last couple questions. Since worship is a personal as well as corporate experience, wouldn't the best worship be that which brings people into the presence of God, whether it's culturally unique or not? Let me take a poke at that. Um, our daughter is Orthodox. And uh, the music they have in the Orthodox Church is uh, doesn't have the variety of cultural expression and so forth, and yet Orthodox enter into this worship every time, and it's not sort of culturally appropriate in the West, you know, for uh, you know, mid-American, for Philadelphia people and so forth, and yet it draws people in, and people are drawn into the worship there by the continuing repetition of, of the same liturgy over and over again. I don't know if that's but that, that struck me as something very different from what we're talking about here. To say that it should help people enter into the presence of God, I'm sorry, but that's a very cultural issue too. I mean, um, you know, some of us who teach this stuff, you know, we have these little sound clips of music that is dissonant, cluster harmony. It sounds mournful. And when you ask people what they think they're hearing, they'll say, well, that's a funeral you know, or that's this or that. Um, Well, actually, that particular song was written for the dedication of the Bible in that language. And the the text says, the word of God makes me so very happy. (laughs) So what does it mean to enter into the presence of God if the cultural form doesn't speak to you or speaks the opposite of what you think it is? Wonderful. All right, so our last 30-second... A response uh, com- comes to this question or this comment. Uh, maybe you want to react to this, to this statement. The church used to be the leader in creation and preservation of art. Now we mimic the art of the rest of the world. Again, these gross generalizations are helpful at times, but then I think, oh my gosh, there's so many places where Christians are still leading in art in different places. But I, I agree that we need to recapture some of that. And some of that imperialistic art from the past where Jesus was a reigning king and a warrior and Constantine is a saint and we kiss the, you know, it was not necessarily uh, reigning Christian art. Uh, so I think it's a, a generalization that, um, that may mislead. So I start with the question that was at the very beginning, the church. Uh, who's the church right now? Just for the record, Two-thirds of the church now lives in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So I'm not quite sure. That sounds like an old question to me of the church in the West 
Although I don't know. I'd have to talk to the person who asked the question. But is it true that the church today around the world does this? Um, I think that requires a little more research. Please join me in thanking our speaker, Dr. Crable and Dean Sundquist. Thank <laughs> you.